welcome to, uh, I think, the third in a series on, um, on big data, data analytics. Uh, we have the uh, distinguished honor of probably having the longest title of a session uh, at uh, this year's ELC. And of course, this has been characterized as a talk tank. So it's even, even more specification. And I've told these gentlemen that instead of it being a talk tank, we want it to be a shark tank. So we want you not to be afraid to ask questions, be provocative, challenge, and offer you know, your own insights into this. And I want, you to, I want everyone in the audience to look at this screen carefully. Keep looking at it. It will never change. <laughs> <laughs> there are no PowerPoint slides being used. So that is what you're going to see the entire time. And at some point, you'll see some subliminal messages coming through saying, ask questions, OK? So I want you to try to, I know it's getting toward lunchtime, and we're the act before lunchtime, but tr we want this to be as interactive as possible and engaging as possible. So uh, keep that in mind, and I'll keep it in mind as, as the uh, official moderator. So for this session, you know, we, we have really a, uh, the pleasure of having three very distinguished individuals to join us and talk about different angles and perspectives on, on big data and, and analytics, sort of where things are from a practical perspective inside of government, outside of government, some of the forces at play that are changing it. Uh, Mark Watson is here from the Federal Reserve Bank. He uh, is the VP for uh, research. And uh, if you're a VP for research in a Federal Reserve Bank, you are crunching a lot of data. So Mark can tell us a little bit about, I think, some of the changes in the environment, technology-wise, that really have uh, helped improve uh, what he's doing from a time and quality and uh, cost perspective. Uh, Marshall Presser is here. Uh, Marshall's representing um, a Pivotal. He's the field CTO. I wanted to make sure I got field CTO in that title. And uh, Marshall has a wealth of experience working with clients all around government, IRS and so forth, that are, have been using, actually, as you know, uh, there's nothing new about um, big data and data analytics. We've been using it for quite some time. Uh, uh, in different varieties. So I think uh, Marshall can bring perspective in terms of what he's seeing from a, from a provider angle to, his, to the client side. And what are some of, the, some of the challenges and interactions that are taking place there. And our third distinguished panelist needs no introduction, Richard Spires, former CIO at DHS, also at IRS. Uh, Richard uh, also, before coming into government, had his own company, Mantis, uh, that provided analytical, BI analytical solutions to the financial uh, management services industry. So Richard comes with a, a wealth of inside and outside expertise and we can have a dialogue about what, Richard, you have seen as some of the challenges with the analytics side uh, in the field. So uh, start thinking about, you know, there's already been two sessions. Some of you didn't get your uh, questions answered in the prior session, so just feel free to toss it up to them uh, and let them try to answer it for you. Um, <laughs> The moderator takes no questions. The moderator just channels questions to someone else. So that's another game rule that we have here. But let's make it fun and interactive and, and dynamic rather than uh, sitting here listening to a bunch of people talk. Let's, let's exchange some ideas and some concerns and some practices that you've experienced as both on the industry side as solution providers and on the government side as a consumer of analytics. And let's get that real clear so these guys know. How many of you in the room are from industry? OK. <laughs> there you have it. How many of you from industry are in the analytics, big data, uh, product field or solution field? All right, Rich. How many people are from government? That's not bad. Seem to congregate it over here. So we'll uh, do that. So that gives you an idea of the mix of the audience. So Marshall, why don't you start us off because you know you have this, uh, you've seen the evolution take place, but you also have seen the variety in the client base. The solution set in government, you know, moves all the way from data act tools, data data analysis tools that are doing simple data aggregation, all the way around the circle to predictive analysis, modeling, simulation, 
traditional data mining type stuff that's been done with very complicated data sets similar to what Mark is dealing with. So describe for us, you know, what is actually going on in the analytics field in government? How are we moving from a how much are we doing and counting to how well are we doing it and making a difference? Um, well, so I think we started out a while ago with what I, traditional business intelligence tools, which were mostly backward looking. Yeah. They measured, you know, what we had done and how well we had done it. And we sliced and diced it in a variety of dimensions so we could, could see it from a variety of angles. Almost a rear, rear uh, mirror view. Yes. Looking at what already had right. transpired. Um, and I, we're moving now into a more predictive phase where we're taking all that historical data that we've sliced and diced. And to your point about aggregation, we are de-aggregating it because we discovered that aggregation is our enemy in trying to do prediction. We right. need to look at the raw data. Um, in the last um, set of speakers, there was, talk, there was a discussion about you know, people getting data sets that were 100 variables wide and narrowing down to 50 wide and narrowing down to 20 wide. And there's a lot of goodness in that, but there's also some loss in that. Um, so we have, for example, customers in the intelligence community and other communities in which they get data that only in retrospect do they know can be good predictive data. Mm -hmm. um, for, example, um, uh, hmm. for example, in, um, in the financial regulation community, um, the well-known Enron email corpus, which is publicly available for anyone to download, people after the fact saw years that email that were sent five years ago were indicative of things that were going to happen. And code words that we, we saw in the end state were first used five years ago. So we have to realize that when we start aggregating data and narrowing data sets, while there's computationally good reason for that, we're throwing good stuff away that later we may need for forensic purposes. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that there have been discussions about is aggregating data from many sources. Um, if this was easy, um, we'd all be rich, and I'd be sitting on my private island in the Caribbean today um, rather than being here. But it is a very difficult problem to do. And I think that's one of the great challenges. Um, but companies have done this, and they've done this by, among other things, mandating uh, common formats, open standards for, for data exchange, which has been successful. Mm -hmm. The other thing, and I'll finish with this, is that um, doing big data analytics is hard work. It requires a specialized skill set. Um, of people who we call data scientists. Um, and there's a limited supply of those data scientists. And most of the end users, the people who are actually going to utilize the insights, are not data scientists. And we have to make tools for them to use where they don't have to understand the vagaries of close to collinearity in linear regressions, like your folks have to do. OK, so um, I think being able to produce end user tools to utilize that, that can be run on tablets, that can be run on, well, iPhones, probably not enough real estate on the screen. Those are the important challenges, plus other technical Other ones. things. But you know, you raise a great point, and I think you've, you've expressed this in some of the other talks that you've done that hits on that last point, which I think is very, very, very important. You know, we get drowned, we drown in data, data uh, big data discussions sometimes because oftentimes it's involving huge data sets, scientific uh, nature, uh, very complicated operational nature, uh, financial uh, modeling and simulation. But it seems to me that what's happened, and I use a phrase that I think I've heard you say, that we have a consumer grade level of analytics that's very important that we don't want to miss. Sometimes that involves translation of the complicated analysis that's already been done. In other cases, it probably requires end-user tools, as you said, to do more navigation, more visualization in a way that really makes sense. So is, is, that, is that a real challenge for a lot of agencies that are pumping into analytical uh, methodologies? Uh, I don't think we've gotten there yet in the federal government as well as the private sector had. But here's an example of them, Yelp. 
Yelp is a big data analytics thing, but we can all use it where none of us has any idea what algorithms are used that you know ch chose Joe's Chow House as the best place to have a cup of coffee in Eureka, Missouri. Or right, now. right. So we've got a lot of industry here in the room. What about this concept of consumer grade analytics versus you know the in depth data engineering? Uh, only if you only understand it if you're a specialist angle. You guys are in, you're not over here because you're the government guys. Uh, over here, this is the uh, <laughs> industry side. Um, what, what's been your feeling for how the market maybe is evolving? Anybody want to volunteer a comment? You don't have to grab the microphone. You stand up and just say something. Yep. Hi, Linda. Um, uh, personal friends already? Okay, that's all right. Plant, plant, this must be a planted question or comment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working with the intelligence community, and one of the things that I've noticed working with analysts, not technical people, is that they're most concerned not about their tools, you know, not about the technology, although they are concerned about that, but the process and how to document the process, how to make sure it doesn't go anywhere afterwards, mm -hmm. you know, after they leave, how to prove that they're effective so that they are able to get money from Congress. So um, I think that, that I, I love all the data tools. I think there's some great things out there. I work with a company that has wonderful data tools. Um, but I do think from talking to analysts, that's one issue that they are more concerned about, how to keep their trade craft at, you know, and be able to make sure that it goes more. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I would say the, the intelligence community probably has different concerns than many of the civilian agencies in terms of uh, what it is they're trying to do, um, the difficulty in integrating data of very widely varied data sources uh, with lots of it in a timely fashion. Uh, some of the other analytic tools that our customers use don't need the same sort of speed of analysis uh, or depth of analysis. Um, or uh, the ability to integrate you know, video, audio, uh, email, text files, arbitrary text, uh, relational stuff, all in. Uh, so that's, they, they have a particularly difficult task. And they're also really looking in many ways for anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. And anomaly detection is difficult, um, but um, doable. Can I pick you up sure on can. this? You sure can, jump um, right in. <clears throat> So I tend to separate this into two major classes of um, the whole data aggregation set of issues mm -hmm. and then the data analytics as we call it now. You know, it's funny because 10 years ago when I was actually in the private sector in a product company, it was called data mining, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and specialists will talk about differences, but, you know, we're, we're changing terms. But underlying, a lot of the algorithms are the same, although there's a lot of new developments, um, and I'm not a specialist in this area. But I think we've come a long way on the pure analytics side, right? And, and with things like Hadoop and other ways to, to bring um, quite a bit of computing power, right, <laughs> to these problems, you can solve problems that, you know, a decade ago, we really couldn't solve in any kind of reasonable time frame, and you can do today. That's fantastic. So what's happened, though, is, <clears throat> of course, things move on, and you start to look at problems that require what I would call your data aggregation. And this was talked a lot about in the last two sessions. Um, this is hard stuff, yeah. because it's not just about technology anymore, right? It's, it's about can you get people to actually give you the data that you want to aggregate so you can actually do the analytics against it right. and come up with really good results. And there are many instances where this is taking place. And uh, there was a question last time about success stories. And I, I think there's no doubt we're a much safer country today than we were at, at 9, when 9-11 happened because there are tremendous data sharing that's gone on and tremendous analytics that are brought to that data. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are a lot of things that we are still missing. And um, I'll give you a couple of big problems right now that I see. Um, the cultural problem is probably the biggest one that was talked a lot about, and we can certainly dive into that more. But on the more technology side, you know, this whole issue of identity management and identity resolution, because most of the, inter not all, but a lot of the interesting problems that you want to look at big data against involve us, you know, us like people. 
And uh, once you start to aggregate, right, then you, and you start to um, not look at an individual level anymore, you start to lose some data. And, you look, and, and so you want to be able to do things in such a way that even get down to an individual level, yeah. like in healthcare. I mean, you know, I am now engaged in discussions with HHS in a different couple different areas, and you know, uh, NIH and some of the things they're doing in clinical trials, and FDA with drugs, and CMS, okay, with payment. You'd love to be able to pull that data together, okay, even at an individual level. Some real barriers to be able to do that right Absolutely. now on the legal side, and on identity management side. Uh, identity resolution, okay? I mean, how I'm represented in one system, how I'm represented in another system can be very different. These are problems that are, are, uh, are big issues to doing the kind of big data that I think a lot of us would like to see in the federal government. On the positive side, we're starting to see some new tools, new technology, some of the big vendors, some of the startups uh, that we've been looking at um, that are really trying to tackle these issues. And I think over the next three to five years, you're gonna see some significant headway made in some of these underlying problems around the data aggregation that would allow us to bring these powerful analytics in ways that we've not been able to do today. So one rule for you, Richard, is I don't want you talking for very long because you're gonna lose your voice. I know, by the time, <laughs> time we're done, I won't have my voice at so all. So preserve, right? preserve, preserve. Yes. Uh, very, very good comments, I think all right on target. I wanna come back to some of that. But let me jump to Mark. Because uh, we, uh, we, we did do a pre-planning call. I know it's hard to believe, but we did do a pre-planning call on this. <laughs> and uh, so I got to understand a little bit about Mark's world. And it is a, it is a big data world involving uh, the financial modeling that's done for the, for the Reserve Bank. So tell us a little bit. I think what's very interesting in this field is the, the uh, progression that has occurred. Um, you're involved in something where there's an enormous amount of modeling, Monte Carlo, regressions, all sorts of stuff going on with huge amounts of data. What's been the landscape change uh, for you, and how does it benefit you in terms of timeliness, quality, speed, precision? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to show that's what's happening with these tools. It's not just about doing things in a cool way, but that it's really answering your business needs. So how has that really changed for you? Um, <clears throat> um, the technology, um, the tools, um, it's not new. The premise is very simple. And, you know, I, a lot of times I don't like using the term big data, I'll just say large data. Uh, the, the premise, divide and conquer. We're going to take this large set of data we're gonna cut it up into small pieces and we're gonna concurrently work on it at the same time in parallel, divide and conquer. Mm. Um, we learned my group five years ago, a group of econ and, and really what my group does, we support monetary policy. We support about 500 PhD economists, researchers and their research assistants in um, financial, statistical, econometric work. Five years ago, a group came to me and said, hey, Mark, uh, we got a set of data. Everybody's doing most of their computing in Kansas City. Doesn't make sense, all of us uh, setting up our own database system. Would you host it for us? Uh, you know, mortgage data. And again, at that point, we were in the middle of the foreclosure crisis. And they were using loan level mortgage data. 70% coverage of all first lien, second lien loans in the United States. Our first thought was no big deal. We'll just take this time series data. It's 20 years worth. We'll throw it in. My group, we like using open source technology. Throw it in a Postgres database. You know, we'll knock this off. Well, I forgot to ask actually how much. You know, <laughs> really, you know, how, really, how much? Are we talking? You know, I'm thinking a couple hundred, 500 gigs. Now we're starting to talk terabyte two, three. Well, the problem that we ran into with large data, if you are thinking serial and if you are thinking transactional, that is the wrong approach. When you're dealing with large data, it is a parallel analytical problem. We took the traditional approach, and in two weeks, my group, we knew we were in trouble. I mean, we were in big trouble. Four months later, when we shifted the paradigm and took a parallel processing method, 
in an analytical, analytical approach, our process is sped up to 300 not percent of times faster. Um, we deal with um, billions of observations. When you talk stress testing the largest, 29 largest institutions in the continental United States, I have their data. And so when we talk account level credit card data, because see in the past they used to be able to take aggregated credit card data or aggregated loan level mortgage data. Today we can take account level credit card data, 22 billion observations. I can actually take that data in its compressed format, do 138 business logic checks just to see if it's going to pass those checks before I throw it in the database. One of the speakers that was before us had mentioned ELT, excuse me, ETL. In our world, we don't do ETL because ETL is more serial processing in nature. Our goal is to take large data, you slam it in a parallel database, and there are lots of vendors, lots of products. Um, there are some <coughs> differences between, but at the end of the day, the bottom line is you're taking large data, you're slamming it into a parallel database, data warehouse, and then you do your transformation. Why? Because you can take advantage of parallelization. If you are not thinking serial, or excuse me, if you're not thinking in parallel terms when you're trying to deal with large data, you're not gonna go anywhere. But if you start thinking in terms of cutting into small parts, concurrently working on it at the same time, working with large data is like cutting butter. When I think of analytics, the analytics my users want to do, we want to get away from what people did in the past. Quarry and pull a subset out to then use SAS or State or MATLAB, some statistical tool to do the analytics. Why? Because when I'm pulling it out, it takes time. When it's out and I'm doing the analysis, it's serial processing. Today what people are doing, today what we're doing, because this is not vaporware. People have been doing this for a long time. Why query to pull it out to do the analytics when you can do the analytics where the data sits? And when I think in terms of analytics, what my users want to do are things like logistics regression, survival analysis. When you pull it out, you're only working with the sample. When you do it on the inside, you're working with the full set of data. So to be able to do analytics, econometric analysis, right where the data sits, and you're actually being able to take advantage of parallelization, you know, again, it's like cutting butter. Mark, does it come with challenges when you, you know, that you've described, I think, pretty well the past, which is ETL and right. taking subsets and serial processing and how it's moved into these massive parallel processing and distributed file system approaches using Hadoop and other tools. Are there any challenges? that that presents for you? Well, the challenge is... I know there's got to be a bad side, you know. So well, we're trying okay. to get to some of that. Well, okay, the, the bad side, it's the, it's the model. It's the model how IT and business works together. You just can't take data and throw it over the fence and think IT is going to be able to provision it real quickly mm -hmm. or provide people the ability to make unencumbered queries against it. For every data source we have, we either have an economist or an SME, just one. Because... This type of data, when you're talking large amounts of data, people are always working with it, using it, uncovering, discovering things. IT, if you don't use it, you don't know nothing about the data. It takes those who know the data actually working with IT to make it work. Mm -hmm. That's the magic sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, the tools and the technology, they've been around for a long time. Um, but also the big thing is, it's finding that right mix of person. My guys, I hire software engineers, because fundamentally we believe that when you're working with large data, it's a hardware software issue. We spend lots of money on these multi-processor, multi-core boxes. And inherently, when you look at the traditional software, it's really only using a few cores. But the minute you find the right software to maximize the hardware, as in keeping all those cores busy, 
keeping CPU utilization high, IO weight low, you know, again, ripping through large amounts of data, doing, um, you know, qual and when I say quality checks, what's the percent of outliers? How sparse is the data? What's the completeness of the data? What's the timeliness of the data? On 22 billion observations, I can do 139 checks, and this is probably an eight terabyte data set, compressed hmm, 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But again, it's being able to take advantage of parallelization and not thinking serial processing. So we got a question here. Okay. Actually, depending on the type of, I, 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 I'm not going to get into the, the actual product that we're using, but we're using a parallel data warehouse. So you've got, you know, your top, you know, you got Teradata, Green, Plum, Natiza, Vertica, a bunch of them. But at the end of the day, what you worry about is how evenly am I spreading the data? Because really, in theory, how it works, if I have an eight-core box, instead of having one database, when you're looking at parallel data warehousing technology, for every core, I got a database. If it's an eight-core box, I got eight instances of the database running, each bound to a core, which means effectively now they're all using the cores, each holding one-eighth of the data, a different one-eighth. Mm -hmm. If I had four boxes clustered together, all eight cores, now I've got 32 instances of the database running, each bound to a core, each holding one-thirty-second of the data, a different one-thirty-second of the data. What you worry about today is, are all the processors running at the same speed? Because if one is running at half the speed of the other 31, the query is only gonna finish when that last one's done. Mm -hmm. And skewing, you know, the data, row skew. If I've got 32 instances of the database, each holds one thirty second of the data. If I've got 30 million observations, if all have 500,000 and then one has, you know, let's say 8 million. The time it takes to get through the 8 million versus the time it takes to get through the 500,000, we're waiting on the 8 million. So am I spreading the data? It's, so you're looking at row skew and CPU skew. So Marshall, uh, a question for you, and I think uh, Richard's alluded to this when, with his comments. You know, one of the big, other big changes is uh, big data and analytics around big data is not all, always about data that's just housed within our institution. We are now, you know, pushing and pushing for democratization of data. We now have huge data sets that are out there for public consumption, for entrepreneurs to build tools with, for somebody to do the analysis. What's the challenge that that democratization is bringing to the analytics side? Well, so there are a number of them. One is um, actually transporting the data. Um, there are people who believe in what are called federated queries. That is to say, we're going to query some multiple data sets, and we're going to have these data sets in separate locations. Mm -hmm. uh, to my mind, that's death, mm -hmm. um, because you're waiting for the slowest one. Uh, the network between A and B is horrible. Uh, it doesn't respond in time. So getting the data in a common data store rather than in silos is, is an important thing. Um, there were, um, I think um, you mentioned, Richard, the problem that, you know, Marshall Presser is known as Marshall Presser in one database and M Presser in another and Michael Presser in a third one because no one ever heard the name Marshall before um, and so on. So there's the, the whole identity issue, resolving the identity issue. Right. And then in the case of uh, data which wants to be anonymized um, for uh, good uh, privacy reasons, um, having the anonymization work so that if my name gets scrambled from, you know, Marshall Presser to Zlignabob, uh, that it gets all, in all systems, gets scrambled in the same way, in a consistent way. Um, that's a hard thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons. Uh, there are security issues um, uh, that you have to deal with. Uh, but getting the data in one place is the best thing, and being able then to do this identity resolution, whether it be of people, whether it 
be, um, for example, I, I worked on a project once for a big telco on amalgamating data from all its network sensors, of which there were hundreds of different kinds, each with its own style of error reports and log files, and trying to sort of build a common data model out of that was, was non-trivial. Right. So um, there are all sorts of technical problems, forgetting about um, you know, the problems of group A doesn't want to share data with group B, mm -hmm. or does, uh, and sometimes this is legitimate um, reason. So, for example, if they wanted to do a credit check on me, and as well as a tax check on me, as well as some other check on me, they might have to go to system number one and say, is there a Marshall presser with social security number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero? And then they'd have to go to someplace else and say, does Marshall Presser have any outstanding warrants against them? And they go to another place where they say, um, is uh, what's Marshall Credit's Presser's credit worthiness, et cetera, et cetera. None of those organizations is going to allow you to move their data into a common place. So being able to deal with mandatory distribution is, is, is a huge issue there. Good. So we, we've roamed around the ranch here. We've heard it a little, some, a lot of doggies on the ranch. Uh, we've covered a lot of topics. I know we've kind of been going around all over the map, which is what I intended to do. What questions do you have uh, for any of the panelists? If you want it all, all to address or a specific one, let me, let me know. If, can you get to the mic just so people can hear you? Thanks. And I'll come over here to you guys next. Hi, Debbie Granberry with CSC. So taking off on what all three of you have said, in government we have disparate databases, and they're huge. Disparate, um, you know, in one organization you have many, many, many warehouses and data marts that are all segregated, siloed, different data standardization, or no, no standardization, and yet the mandate is there to get information out of those databases. I mean, clearly in Homeland Security, clearly in healthcare, um, clearly in financial regulation. We have got to get that done. So based on what you've said, given the fact that we have these legacy systems and it becomes difficult to get all the data in one place, what are the alternatives and what's the analysis of alternatives in terms of the advantages, benefits on either side of that? I mean, and I know that's a big question, but, but from a, a high level, can you help us sort of think about that? I'll start. Um, it's a very good question. It's in, in some ways, I think it's one of the big questions in government right now in the big data arena. Um, a couple points, and I'll, I'll allude back to the, the last set of speakers um, who were very passionate about some of the cultural changes, as I am too. That being said, also trying to be a realist that, I mean, one, you know, the laws around privacy or other legal restrictions, or even the policies within agencies will vary. It makes it very difficult sometimes to cross agency boundaries on some of this. And um, I'm going to pick up on what one of the speakers last, uh, he was talking about uh, where technology is going. And let me pick back up on that because I, I do think it is a way forward to help us with some of these problems. So whether it's better entity resolution, which is act actually a difficult problem in of itself, but, but at least it's one that's kind of encapsulated. And there's, a, there's certainly tool sets that continue to leapfrog each other on, get, on doing better entity resolution. But I think this whole issue of um, how do we actually, without moving the data, because believe me, that's the last, I mean, that's not gonna happen on a lot of these problems we're talking about. But this notion that you're gonna be able to go out and in a way that both protects the privacy, okay, of an individual, but be able to touch various databases, <clears throat> like you were describing, and be able to aggregate information, do analytics, may not be as sophisticated as, as, as analytics as you could if you could bring all the data together. But a lot, of, believe me, a lot of the problems I see is it's an incomplete data set problem, right? I mean, if we had the, the, the complete data set, the analytics are not that, it's not that difficult, but we don't have complete data sets. So the degree that we can do this in an anonymous way, 
okay? So that essentially you're doing the computations in a way that nobody has access to the data itself, even down to an individual level, but you get triggers, okay? So if you find an anomaly or if you find a hit, okay, then you have the ability to get that data, okay? So you're, if you're finding that needle in the haystack around a particular individual or whatever it may be, you're only going to see it if you actually get a hit, all right? So that you're protecting the privacy of the vast majority, okay, but you're only actually looking for the anomaly. And I think that's where we need to get. And I believe that we're getting to the point where there are tool sets that are available today. I won't say they're mature yet, but you're seeing tool sets come out um, from a number of different um, companies that are working this problem that I think are going to enable us to move forward even with all the privacy restrictions and all the legal impediments that we see to do this kind of work. Doesn't solve all the cultural problems where I just don't want to share my data, right? Mm -hmm. But at least it makes it a lot harder for someone to say, well, I don't want to share my data because I'm worried about privacy or I'm worried about the security, right? If we can protect that data in, in the right way, yet still leverage that data by not, but not take it out of your enterprise, I think we've got a long way to solving some of those issues. Good point, yeah. Uh, let me answer this in two separate ways. One is the sort of procedural data science way. Okay, I've got 10 data sets. I'm not going to try and build a model initially that integrates 10 data sets. I'm going to go and look at two of them that I think are relevant and see what information I can get out of those two. And if those two are relevant, then I'll add a third one. And then I'll add a fourth one in a sort of agile development way. Uh, the second thing, um, as to uh, the privacy, uh, we have one agency that has sub-agencies, um, and they wanted to build a data model where all the sub-agencies could share information. And the sharing rule that they established between the subunits was any column that y you were willing to share in the common data model, you know, in the table, you'd be able to see that from the other sub-entities. So there was built into the sharing model some sort of incentive to, to, to make people want to share data because they could see mm -hmm. other stuff. And it seems to have worked out fairly well in this case as, as a sharing model. Good. Will this work for everybody? Maybe yeah, maybe no, but I think it gets you a step down the line. Got a question from over here, anyone? Comment? Okay, quick, just a quick question, because we're running run out of time. Hi, Salish Patel from CNSI. For the panel, going back, I don't think it's working, going back to the morning or the beginning discussion about um, consumer grade analytics, what are some of the tools, I'm not looking for product names or anything, what are some of the tools, standards, technologies, et cetera, that's making or could make data more usable by the average person? I'm not talking about the analysts. If you look at an organization, about three to four percent typically make use of BI. The 96 or 97 percent of the ones that actually need it for decision making, et cetera. How do you make it more available for them? Mm. What are some of the standards, technologies, et cetera, that you see that today are coming in the future? And can you just uh, let each one of you, or whoever wants to answer, but can just keep it short because I want to ask one last question before we run out of time. Probably the. Uh core fundamental technologies we're going to use in my, my area, either MPP, Hadoop, um, in, data, you know, in memory databases. Uh, if performance is an issue and your sources aren't too large, my users are all concerned about speed, speed and performance. If they could go directly to the vendor or the data aggregator and get the data, they would. Um, like people say, if you build a better mousetrap, they'll come. That's how we wind up getting a lot of different types of data within our system, just due to, you know, if you want the true raw performance, um, <clears throat> this is where you got to put it. Right. We're seeing a number of small vendors build, um, you know, web-based, uh, GUI-based um, visualization tools right. that work on large data sets in a reasonably user-friendly manner. Um, the strength of that is that these are incredibly user-friendly. 
the weakness of this is that you know, if you want to do something sophisticated and is more uh, special cased, then somebody's got to write code to do that. It doesn't, it's not the end user, but it's a layer above the end users. And, and when we do development, our, our goal is when we produce stuff for end users who are not experts, is to have them literally chained to the developer's desk while we do the, the development of the app. So that we're constantly looking at, does this work for you? Does this work for you? Is this the view of the information that you want to see? And unless you do it that way, um, I, I don't see much hope for general purpose tools. OK. That's an interesting observation. I wish we had more time to maybe get into a discussion around that. I'm going to let you save your voice for the last question. Okay. So we're, we're almost out of time. I know everybody is dying to get to lunch. Uh, I want to ask each one of you, if you will, since we've got a mixed audience here of industry and government, in 30 seconds or less, um, that's the challenge, 30 seconds or less, what's the one, one piece of advice that you would want to leave with industry, and what's the one piece of advice you want to leave with government <laughs> folks here in the room <laughs> about the use of data analytics? Well, I could answer it in 30 seconds, but I'd need about five minutes to think about it. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's the problem. <laughs> well, so, I, Hadoop eyes it, you know. <laughs> I, I guess uh, uh, maybe it's the same advice for both, which I, I think, um, what I, in my experience, okay, I come back to this point, um, there are a lot of good analytics capabilities, right? And, but I keep coming back to this, the data, the completeness of the data sets you're dealing with and the quality of the data itself, mm -hmm. right? And what, what I have found is that um, I think vendors tend to oversell their capabilities because, it, right? I mean, they, they will work. With perfect data, they will work very well, but where's the perfect data? And on the government side, I think, um, and I was recently with the government, we really underestimate what it takes to get complete data sets and to have good quality data. Yeah, good points. Yeah. So uh, I would say it's called data science for a reason. It's called data science because we're experimenting with this and we're going to fail. And therefore, when you build something, build it with the notion that you're going to try something, you're going to fail, you're going to refine it, you're going to iterate on to the next one, and you know, at every stage kind of build, for lack of a better phrase, the minimally acceptable application at that level that's going to get you to the next phase. Right. If you try and boil the ocean, you're dead. Yeah, good points. Uh, for the right. government side, uh, a lot of it's going to come down to the skill set of your people. You know, the good, strong um, programming, mathematical background, uh, good understanding of um, data structures. Uh, you can start from there and you can actually build people and mold them into what you want. Um, and then another thing, when you're dealing with large data, it really is a parallel and analytical problem and not a serial transactional problem. So the, that's really the approach that you want to take. For industry, um, uh, with, with me in industry, you got to prove what you're, um, <laughs> you're putting out there. Yeah. Right? You know, there's a lot, lot, of, lot, there's a lot of noise. Uh, there's a lot of vaporware out there sometimes. And, but there are, there are groups out there that really have some good stuff going on. Yeah. Just look carefully. Yeah. So we've had this annoying group next to us making all this loud noise and having fun. So let me count down, one, two, three, and on three, will you all give the biggest <laughs> applause, <laughs> yippee-io, that you want for this group today. One, two, three.